Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of our weekly Think Tank for Monday, 29th of March. My name is Carl Capalingua, and I'm the market analyst over here at Think Markets. It is a pleasure to be with you as we delve into everything that happened last week and have a good look ahead to the week that's on its way. Before we do, we'll talk about the Think Markets difference, which is substantial. $8 flat rate trades, your own holder identification number, unlimited phone support, and of course, no hidden platform or s- subscription fees for fantastic reasons to make sure your next ASX share trade is with Think Markets. The agenda for today is to check out the key market moves from all of the key markets around the world for last week. Uh, we'll see what's going on in that COVID situation, a worrying turn up in COVID cases in Europe. Check out what's going on with the key macroeconomic data, see what the brokers are saying about some stocks of interest. Have a look at where the value is in the Australian market and what's going on on the technical side of things. A very interesting chart I've got to show you there. And then we'll see what's coming up for next week. Okay, let's kick off with the Australian stock market and a really strong performance, um, up 1.73%. Doesn't look like much, but it was broad based. So you can see all but one sector higher during the week and some nice moves within those sectors. And th- this has all occurred on the back of over $12 billion worth of um, dividends coming out of the market. So um, ex- when a stock goes ex-dividend, the price falls typically by amount, the amount of the dividend and, and over here um, also some an extra portion because of franking credits. And the market indices we're looking at here are reflective of those price falls. So we saw a strong push up in prices despite the fact that we had a huge amount of dividends coming out. Incidentally, another 6 billion dividends worth of dividends slated for this week. So I think it is a very, very impressive performance. Most impressive by the healthcare sector, up about 5%. We've got some really big overseas earners in there, and we've had a fall in the Australian dollar during the week, and that's certainly um, helped them, or certainly helped them outperform uh, the broader market up move. Lagging, I'd say technology, the clear <laughs> laggard there, down point. 0.3%, the only sector really to miss out. And of course, um, you know, this sector is full of those longer duration stocks. So stocks who are high growth, whose earnings are much further down the track than really the rest of the market. And when interest rates go up as they have, I've got an interest rate chart for you coming up, but interest rates have gone up and therefore um, those earnings are further out and they get discounted, discounted more severely than the rest of the market. Otherwise, a pretty strong performance across the board. I note uh, discretionary did really well, but also um, property trust, staples, telecoms, and utilities doing very well. Also, good to see volatility coming down. It really does set us up for a very, very strong week this week, I believe. Um, there are some things that have happened over the weekend, of course, since that close. We've got uh, a COVID, developing COVID situation in Queensland that we're watching, so it's, we're unsure as to how that's going to impact the market. Um, job keepers have rolled off, but hey, the market knows that sort of stuff. Um, really, probably just the COVID ones is news. It's, uh, it's from left field. But look, I think we'll take it in a stride because we've, we're learning that these um, situations tend to be quite localised. Just So I think we'll take that in a stride this week. Um, interest rates, I mentioned earlier, this is what it's all about. So we've seen obviously a big uh, move up in the long-term yields in Australia, which our borrowing rates tend to be set at, both uh, corporate and uh, consumer-based. But we've seen a a bit of an easing off here over the last couple of weeks, and that's helping our stock market move a little bit higher. We can certainly see last week we had a a string of pretty good candles there. Despite those dividends, we are in a pretty well-established, I think, consolidation zone here between 66.50 or so and up to 69.40 or so. Um, we're going to open pretty well this morning based upon the SPY futures, but again, that doesn't have some of those Queensland developments which occurred over the weekend, but I'm confident that this week we will at least have a look at this level here at 69.38. Um, it's not about whether we look at it, it's more about whether we close above it. And if we can see some nice white, white candles coming in uh, in this week's sessions and a close above that level, I think that is really, really constructive for a breakout of this range and a move higher. Um, now, how high could we go? And it's not about being optimistic, it's just about calling what I see. But it, you know, if you look at the move that we had from here to here, okay, and you measure that up, from this low here, which is the, the, the swing low that I think you need to measure it from, then what's that? It's uh, 6,900, 5,700. Yeah, let's, let's round it and call it 1,100 points uh, from 65. Could take us into 7,600. Uh, now, that doesn't mean we get there next week. And we look at how long this took to, to accomplish. Uh, you're looking at uh, yeah, nearly 
well, it's def definitely five months, but um, you know, the better part, part of six months. So that puts us uh, you know, at the end of September uh, to, to have you know, any chance of sort of getting there. So you know, just, just, it's just about having, um, uh, I guess, a concept, you know, uh, an idea of what could happen and, and then you know, massaging your portfolio based around those probabilities. Uh, and that's the great thing about technical analysis. If I'm wrong, well, the chart's going to show that and we're going to see a bunch of black candles and we're probably going to go down here, in which case we'll have a different scenario where we, we come back down to this resistance. But again, it's just giving you a roadmap by which you, you get to manage your money. Okay, um, let's, we need to pick up the pace here. We're running a little bit behind. Uh, so we've got um, overseas markets here, down 2% on the Nikkei and the Hang Seng, about the same Shanghai. I managed to eke out a little gain. Uh, I don't think anything too sinister there. Nothing sinister going on in US markets. The Dow Jones was up 1.36%. S&P 500 a little bit better at 1.6%. The chart of the S&P 500 looks amazing. I think I've got one coming up for us to look at. And we talked about those tech stocks missing out and the reason why they're missing out. The Nasdaq looks fine, by the way. Don't uh, panic on that one. It just doesn't look as good as the S&P 500. And I think it'll get dragged up kicking and screaming with the rest of those more value and cyclical based stocks. Uh, Europe looks very good. The DAX has uh, made a new all-time high last week. The FTSE is starting to come around and look a little better and the CACs are pretty solid there as well, although down a little. But certainly if you're uh, in index trading, you like trading CFDs, go and have a look at some of those European markets that look fantastic. Another chart that's looking fantastic, or another market that's looking fantastic, is the S&P 500 in the USA. And it looks set to break to new all-time highs this week. And we're going to be um, calling an S&P 500 with a four in front of it, which is pretty amazing considering where we were about 12 months ago, which is obviously not on this chart because we've moved past it now. Um, but uh, look, look how far we've come uh, through a global pandemic. And that is a testament to the amount of stimulus and cash sloshing around uh, and a lot of that getting into investors' pockets and therefore into the market. But hey, the trend is your friend here. Short-term trend looks great, long-term trend looks great. And um, these really nice candles coming in Thursday, Friday, I think, um, sets us up for a fantastic week this week, fingers crossed. Not looking so good at the moment. Uh, the base metals looking a little dubious in some of their rallies last week, down around about 1%. Long-term trends are still very much higher. Um, we've seen a rally in the US dollar. I mentioned that earlier, and that certainly doesn't help these. some of the heat coming out. But um, I don't think there's anything too sinister going on here. You know, base metals will be a beneficiary of the uh, spending boom uh, coming up and, and, and uh, a touted uh, potential infrastructure boom also that could be um, occurring. We've got Biden, rumours are that he's got, he's got a $4 trillion infrastructure package to be released um, sometime this year and uh, that will you know, provide under, underlying support for metals and therefore bringing that back to our market, obviously the materials sector. Good to see China iron ore popping up a little bit. That's had a tough time of it lately, uh, as has nickel. So I think that's the, they're the two uh, key ones to watch there. That's impressive. The gold didn't have a great week. Silver had a worse week. Yields have gone back up again and gold and silver with zero yield. And, you know, we've got cost of carry to boot, uh, not looking anywhere near as attractive now as they were uh, you know, six to 12 months ago. Uh, energy prices were down for the week, but fairly steady after their uh, decline. I've got a chart coming up for you. I think um, the energy complex still looks pretty strong. We mentioned that weakness in the Australian dollar helping the healthcare sector, and that's where it is right there. We've talked about the strength in the US dollar taking the edge off some of those big moves that we saw in 2020, uh, and that's what's going on there. And then we saw interest rates coming down nicely in Australia, about 10 basis points and about five in the US, giving the share market a little bit of room to move to the upside. Also a little bit of room to move to the upside, I think, on West Texas crude oil. We know that there was a big dip last week, some geopolitical tensions between the US and Russia saw um, the price of oil tumbling. But we've seen some nice candles come in here on uh, Wednesday and then Friday, I think, to set this low. Uh, 57.25. That's really a major low. And if we got below it, I think you've got a great um, signal post here. If you get below 57.25, uh, then the oil rally that uh, started in November last year, I would say is over for the time being. But now, as long as this holds, I think we can remain skewed to the upside. And that, of course, has uh, ramifications for our energy sector. Have a look at how we're tracking this time versus last time. And look, the, the picture says it all, doesn't it? We are again, uncannily locked with the GFC um, 
recovery. Uh, that's the orange line, where the light blue line. And if you're to believe this, and there's no reason why you should believe this, there's there's no reason why these two lines should be so close together. But if you do believe it, we've got a big run coming up here, and it kind of fits with everything else I've just talked about. Uh, and then you, I think you want to run for the hills when we get to about here. Now, how far away is that? Um, so we're looking at one and a half months, about six weeks, and about you know, 15% to the upside and then really get very conservative through here. But of course we do um, then pick back up. But hey, I keep saying there's no reason why <laughs> these two lines should be so close together. So we are um, probably getting a little a bit ahead of ourselves. So let's bring it back to some reality. And the reality here is not fantastic for Europe. We're going through, some people are calling it the third wave. Some people are calling it the fourth wave because let's face it, there is a wave there as well. Um, but with rising cases in France, uh, with Spain ticking back up, it's, it's flattening out a little bit in Italy, which is it, which is good. But yeah, not not looking great in Europe. Two hundred ten thousand confirmed cases per day. The United States also taking a little bit of a tick back up after just sneaking below fifty thousand there late last week. But look, we're, we're in a much better place than where we were, I guess, in the US not that long ago. Have a look now at some of the data from last week. The Australian Manufacturing and Services PMIs were released. And uh, we, you, you gel those two things together and you get this composite output index. Uh, so it's a really good indication of how you know, business and industry is going in an economy. Some numbers there to go with the pictures. The composite index rose to... 56.2 and that's up from February's 53.7 just checking my notes here on this other side guys that's why I'm looking across and the services index more specifically went to 56.2 from 53.4 and they're the um, lines over here the blue line is the services the red line is manufacturing the manufacturing index went from 56.9 to 57 so smaller increase or largely flat there so good to see uh, the services industry doing well uh, we saw new work orders received by Australian companies surge that's very positive so that's um, you know it's really it's a really forward looking piece of data it's, it's work that's coming it's growth that's coming it's it's employment that needs to be uh, secured to to make that growth uh, make those orders a reality um, a very strong expansion in business activity ahead uh, new order growth at a 44 month high uh, operating capacities however are under pressure so yes the orders are there but it's hard to get people uh, to, to you know make this work happen and um, firms are employing like crazy uh, also noted in this survey uh, but as a result input costs are starting to rise so there's a lot of supply bottlenecks we've got a, a large container ship blocking the Suez Canal that's not going to help either um, there's a spike in shipping fees etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, whilst things are turning up you have to then wonder how much we can uh, take advantage of this great demand that's in the economy because of some of these supply factors we don't want to see that translate into significantly higher prices because that will um, undermine the RBA's efforts in uh, getting us back to full employment and in the US, we had corresponding data in terms of the manufacturing and services PMIs. Slightly different results, though. They had some pretty bad weather in the sample, uh, which probably had a bit of an impact, but didn't stop the manufacturing PMI rising from 58.5 to 59. It was a little bit behind expectations. And the services PMI going from 58.9 to 60. And again, just a little bit behind um, a weather, probably taking a bigger chunk out than the market was expecting. But nonetheless, we're still heading in the right direction on that one. Durable goods orders are really important uh, data release. This one was significantly adversely impacted by the weather, falling 1.1% much worse than expected and well down from the previous month but I don't think the market really um, worrying about that uh, until we see something really bad happen in, in the next month which I don't think is going to occur as the weather naturally gets warmer in the northern hemisphere. US core PCE price index is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. We know interest rates have been going up on this assumption that inflation is going to spike and uh, you know some people have been talking about hyperinflation with all this stimulus being thrown thrown at the world economy it doesn't seem to be showing up just yet so the previous reading on this PCE index was 0.3 of a percent the actual was 0.1 it's in line with expectations and about 1.4 percent per annum is nothing for the Fed to be too worried about that's good for us 
uh, in terms of personal expenditure and income, again, data really closely watched by the Fed. Uh, we saw a, the previous 2.4% gain turn into a 1% fall, and that was worse than expected on the expenditure side of things. And then the income uh, also a huge drop there, 7% drop in incomes, and that was slightly better than expected. And the reason why the expectations were so, so low is because of that big whiteout we saw in a number of US southern states, and of course COVID still having bit of an impact but it was mainly to do with the weather some markets are generally not too concerned about the weather because those are extremely transient factors okay let's have a look at u.s weekly jobless claims that this was a really good print actually 684,000 compared to the median estimate of 727 dropping below 700,000 for the first time in a very very long time uh, well ahead of the previous estimate we saw um, continuing claims uh, continuing to come down but there are still about 18 million americans claiming some form of unemployment insurance and um, that is way too many the fed wants to see that effectively halve and uh, that of course um, means that they are going to be supporting the economy for a long time to come taking advantage i guess of some of that support is a company like brickworks who has significant operations in the u.s and significant exposure to that u.s home building sector um, which, is, which didn't do that fantastic for it in the last results. Not terrible, but uh, it was noted as one of the um, areas of a little bit of weakness. The local building sector, however, is going absolute gangbusters. They literally cannot make enough bricks to keep up with demand. They're starting uh, new kilns to, to get production up to where uh, the market is wanting it. And that's, of course, because we've got this um, you know, huge stimulus put into the local building industry. And... Um, uh, I was going to talk about what the brokers are saying, but I just want to talk about the chart. The chart looks absolutely fantastic. This um, great big um, consolidation pattern through September until current um, after a nice push up through here. If we break through the top of this range, there's every chance we can repeat this sort of a move to the upside. In terms of what the brokers did say during the week, well, they had uh, the half yearly results to respond to. And we saw Citigroup raise their price target from 22.70 to 23 and retain their buy rating. They said the results were mainly juiced by the property division, which is interesting for a company like Brickworks. You normally think that it's mainly to do with um, building and obviously making bricks, but they do have a, a huge property portfolio as well. And it's largely skewed to that sort of warehousing distribution sector, which has done really, really well in COVID. So they got a great boost from that sector as well. Um, but the earnings outlook more broadly is improving with local building stimulus packages to drive growth uh, in the rest of the business. Macquarie weren't as happy. They lowered their price target just a little, retained their neutral rating. They were impressed with those results. However, they said they were ahead of their expectations, in particular the property division, and they were quite uh, bullish going forward in terms of how the building products division could do and said that demand is um, better locally than in the U.S., However, the only reason why they're not more um, bullish on the stock in terms of their price and their rating is that they believe the stock is fully valued. Not UBS, they increased their price target by quite a bit actually, 2270 to 2364 and retained their buy rating. They liked the results. Also, they did say that the property uh, business was, was a big contributor uh, in warehousing and distribution, as I said, and it has become the main earnings driver of the company. Requires a rethink. Very interesting of how investors view the business building products earnings were actually below their expectations but could improve as the stimulus kicks in and the u.s weather improves we've talked about that a lot in today's session haven't we uh, there's an average buy rating at the moment two strong buys three buys one hold no sales no strong sales uh, in terms of the fundamentals down here look you wouldn't say it's the cheapest stock um, something's going on here with the peg those numbers normally aren't that high, uh, but it could be you know, a, a COVID um, impact issue. The dividend yield is actually pretty good, I think, at 3%. Uh, return on equity is not amazing, um, and neither is enterprise value to revenue. So uh, whilst the chart is a definite tick, uh, this one I could really only give that a, probably a C plus at best, um, but it's good to see this here, and I'll let you decide how you want to play that one. Uh, having a look at the next one is Computer Share. They announced an acquisition in the USA for Wells Fargo's corporate trust services business. Brokers largely like this one. So we saw um, JP Morgan raise the price from 1075 to 12, but retain their underweight rating. Price target rises there for Morgan Stanley, uh, for Citigroup and for Macquarie. And a massive rise there at Macquarie. That is huge. Outperforms at Macquarie. Uh, we've got an overweight at Morgan Stanley, but 
uh, JP Morgan and Citigroup not as impressed. I'll let you press pause and read through some of the details there. Um, a little bit mixed on the picture here with um, mainly, look, mainly buys you'd say, but there are a few sells in there balancing out some of the other ones. The mean estimate for the price is 1560, which is a little bit higher and probably going to head higher because of Macquarie's big pop. And it'll take a couple of days for these numbers to adjust. In terms of the fundamentals, not great. PE is not, no, not particularly expensive, but certainly not cheap. Um, something going on here as well. Uh, dividend yield is fairly reasonable. Um, this is a big tick here though, and I'm probably giving that a B. Um, so it's, um, oh look, I'd give that a tick. The chart looks pretty good. We've got a new uptrend in place, uh, short term uptrends in place. We just need to break through the top of this range and I think you can do very well. Downside I think is fairly limited sort of into this sort of 14 to 1450 zone and your upside is probably back up to those highs at 18. 40. So um, a tick here, a tick there. That's a bit of a question mark. Let you decide. Moving on to the final one, which is Crown Resorts. Of course, um, the biggest news for the week was the Crown Takeover bid launched by Blackstone, which is the private equity group at 11.85 a share. Uh, only a couple of brokers changed their price targets or ratings on them. Uh, Credit Suisse went from 12 to 13.50, retained their outperformed rating. They said the uh, bid was opportunistic and doesn't take into account the earnings upswing post pandemics, the pricing it um, for the for the sort of on a pandemic basis. On a side note, they see a low risk of the company losing its gaming licenses, so that's also a good thing. JP Morgan raised their price target from 950 to 11, retained their whole rating. They said the bid uh, was inadequate, and there's a bit of a conspiracy theory here. Also, Blackstone is already a major shareholder, and uh, JP Morgan said that this bid could be aimed at flushing out a higher competing bid from Star Entertainment Group. Um, that's the takeover bid pop there. Most of the big brokers agree that this is really just sort of the start of a, of, of a, a longer running dance uh, for Crown and uh, we'll uh, have to see how it plays out. So there's probably no point looking at these anyway because of COVID has driven a truck through them um, and given there's a takeover in place, it's going to be about uh, competing bids and higher bids. But I think uh, if you've got it, hang on to it. If you don't have it, then you're looking for other opportunities. Okay, let's check out uh, where the market is in terms of its valuation, we are at 18.6. Now, when you consider we were over 20 not that long ago, uh, the Australian market is looking like pretty good value compared to the rest of the world who is still around that 20 level. I think that'll support prices this week. Um, we've seen a big pullback in the IT sector, but otherwise there's still plenty of value here in materials, uh, financials, on a relative basis, you would say, but um, not all that cheap. Energy is the next one, and they go up from there. Have a look at the technical analysis side of things, and these are the percentage of stocks whose, whose prices are above these moving averages. Now, five periods is about a week, uh, two weeks for 10, and then we go all the way out into one year. Uh, 21 is about a month. Uh, and etc cetera, etc cetera. and we were looking a little bit down in the doldrums so uh, one month ago is the blue line uh, one week ago is the yellow line uh, but you can see this major major uh, repairing of the technical picture over the last few weeks we did respond so negatively initially to those rising interest rates but we've got a handle on it now and I think um, uh, most investors are feeling a bit more comfortable that this is uh, not something more sinister, more, more long-term in terms of uh, you know, negative impacts of inflation coming through and feeling a bit more confident. And it's also reflective of those um, that better technical picture as well. So uh, this is where we do our best work in the bull market when most stocks are partic participating in the rally, uh, where we are now actually better than the pre-COVID high back in February last year. Um, so that is setting us up, I believe, for a, a big move also. Having a look at the upcoming week, we've got building approvals coming out Wednesday. As you can see, there nothing on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, looking down the list, we've got retail sales coming out on Thursday. Having a look to the rest of the world now, uh, we've got consumer confidence numbers coming out on Wednesday. Again, a very quiet Monday and Tuesday. And then don't forget, uh, Friday markets are close to here for Good Friday. In China, we have our manufacturing and services PMIs coming out. We've got a core CPI estimate in Europe. Again, anything inflation related is going to be very closely looked at at the moment. We've got our preliminary sort of employment data. This is a private sector survey on 
uh, non-farm employment change and then naturally you have to look down to Friday where you get the official data coming out and that is the single biggest data release for any economy in the world. Comes out on the first Friday of the month. Uh, between Wednesday and Friday we'll have Chicago PMIs, some home sales data, KCN manufacturing PMI in China, uh, then European PMIs, weekly unemployment claims, more PMIs. Look, it's a busy week. It is a, actually a very, very busy week, and it's going to hit us on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay, that's it for me today. You can catch all of our other market news updates in the market news section of the website. You can follow me or the Think Market handles on Twitter if you like. You do need to get to the webinar section of the website to register for these upcoming events. We've got Ask the Experts coming up on Wednesday where you get to bring your portfolio to the table and I'll do a quick fundamental and technical on the stocks you're interested in. And then of course, please also register for the three series webinars. Uh, this time we're gonna do the three ASX turnaround stocks you wanna keep an eye on. And then after um, another Ask the Experts on 28th of April, and there's a bit of a gap here because I'm taking a little bit of leave, we'll have the fundamental analysis refresher for you on the 5th of May. The disclaimer before I leave you says that everything we talked about today is general in nature. Uh, we are a regulated Australian broker. We do have some products that could see you lose more than your deposits. So please, please, please read this disclaimer carefully. And if you have any questions, give us a call. Thanks for joining me this morning. Hopefully you got lots out of it. All the best for your trading until we catch up again. Bye-bye for now.